All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to do is, uh, a skydive uh, into data integration in uh, Microsoft Fabric. Uh, my name is Jeroen Leitwieler. Uh, I'm a senior product manager on the uh, Microsoft data integration team uh, at Microsoft. Uh, we're working on data flows everywhere, data flows in Power BI, data flows in Power Apps, data flows in Fabric. Um, and my colleague over here, Krishna. Yeah, uh, my name is Krishna Kumar Rukmanidhan. Uh, I'm a product manager with uh, the data integration team in Microsoft. I have around 15 years of experience across uh, data migration, data integration, SQL Server BI technologies and connectivity field. Yeah. Yeah, and today uh, we're going to handle first uh, some more uh, deep dive into uh, data pipelines. Uh, after that, we are doing a uh, deep dive into data flow, how to improve performance, uh, and how to uh, work with the AI infused functions that we have within within data flows. Uh, and then in the end, we do a Q&A. So everything that you have questions about, uh, reserve them to the end and we'll handle your questions then. Uh, and with that said, the sure. floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, let's start with the data pipelines. So uh, within data pipelines, I was having two topics that I would like to cover. One is about the copy performance and the other one about the metadata-driven pipelines. Uh, for the copy performance, uh, I was thinking I'll probably show you guys a demo around how the copy works. Uh, for this use case, I was thinking of uh, pulling a 1TB CSV file, which is stored in my Azure blob storage, and move that to Fabric Lake House as a binary copy, uh, not as a table, just a binary copy here. And I'm leaving the other settings uh, default, which means the staging is disabled and the compute is set to auto. So with that, I will go ahead with the demo video. In this demo, to showcase the copy activity performance, let us perform a binary copy of one terabyte CSV files, which are stored in my Azure blob storage and move this to Fabric Lake House. Let us start by choosing the data factory experience under Microsoft Fabric. Here in the data factory homepage, let's go ahead and choose the data pipeline, provide a name, pick create, once the data pipeline has been created, let's use the copy data copy assistant. In the Copy Data Assistant, you can choose from a variety of different sources or use the sample data. In our case, since the 1TB CSV files are stored under Azure Blob, let's go ahead and choose that. I already have the connection pre-created, so let me go ahead and choose that. Hit the Next button. The next page, I will go ahead and select the container which contains the 1TB CSV files. Here, I will go ahead and choose the schema agnostic since I would want to perform a binary copy. Click next. In the next page, I choose the data destination. Since I would want to move the files to Fabric Lakehouse, let me go ahead and select the fa Fabric Lakehouse and click next. I will go ahead and choose the existing lake house and then hit next. Since I've already created a subfolder inside my lake house, let me click the browse and choose that particular folder. Click OK and then hit the next button. I'm going to leave the file format as binary. Click next. Now. In the review and save page, you can see the copy summary. We are copying the data from Azure Blob Storage and moving that to Fabric Lakehouse. The connection parameters and the container uh, information is provided here. Let me go ahead and hit save and run. This immediately starts saving the copy data and then it goes ahead and starts running the copy uh, data activity as well. As you can see, the copy data activity is now started running. 
it was queued. Now the activity status shows that it's in progress. I can go ahead and click the activity name to give me the details about the current run. As you can see, the copy data activity has succeeded. Let us click on the activity name to get more insights. Here, you can see that we've moved around one TB of CSV files from Azure Blob Storage to Lakehouse in less than four minutes duration. Let's go ahead and click the duration breakdown. Here you can see the optimized throughput being set to maximum. This property is talking about the intelligent throughput optimization value, which was set to default as auto. And then the next one, it's talking about the degree of parallelism, use parallel copies, where the value has been set to 128 threads. Apart from this, you can also find the split up of time being spent in this entire activity. Now let's head back to the lake house to confirm that the file has landed there. There we go. We've got the one TB CSV files being pushed from Azure Blob Storage to the Fabric Lake House in less than four minutes. Thank you. In the so uh, in that demo, what we try to do is simply move a one TB CSV file and land it back to Fabric. And as you can see, it just completed within less than four minutes there. Now, when we actually do a double click in order to see where the duration was spent, right? So what we can see is, of course, uh, we spent around five minutes queuing, yeah? And then reading from the source is around two and a half minutes. Writing to the destination is around three minutes and 18 seconds. And the entire transfer is around three minutes 35 with a total duration of three minutes and 40 seconds. So this split up pretty much lets let us know that, you know, the copy, I mean, reading from the source and writing to the sync happens in parallel, right? So uh, that's a breakdown of what we had just seen. With that, I wanted to quickly uh, show you, uh, you know, a snapshot of how the copy behaves in terms of different copy pairs, that is, uh, different sources and different sinks. So um, in the first, the first one that we have there, I am actually moving around a one TB of uh, data from a parquet uh, to, and I mean, from parquet and landing it onto Fabric Lakehouse as a binary copy. Binary meaning schema agnostic, not the table. So uh, the throughput that we are getting back in here is around five point, close to five gigabytes per second. And uh, the total duration is around 3.31. Keep in mind, the, my, in my demo, I just moved it from uh, uh, the CSV files uh, directly from blob to uh, the lake house, but this one is parquet to lake house. Uh, similarly for a CSV to uh, lake house table in this case, uh, we are reading around 1.5 uh, uh, billion rows back in there, and uh, it pretty much completed in around 13 minutes. The throughput is around 1.2 gigabytes per second, right? Yep. Sure. Sure. So, and uh, the last one that we are looking at here is, uh, of course, there's a SQL conference. So, uh, we, we do have, uh, uh, you know, one copy pair that uh, comes in from the SQL side as well. So, Azure SQL DB to Lakehouse. We are reading around uh, probably 5.12 uh, million records here. And uh, yeah, so a total of 24 gigabytes and it, it did take around less than a, two minutes for it to complete. So uh, just a quick snapshot of how the copy behaves in terms of uh, the performance. Yeah. And uh, with that, let's just look at how copy achieves this performance, right? So really how copy scales. So copy scales at multiple levels here. So uh, of course the first one being at the connection level, we did see a glimpse of it in the demo as well, where uh, you, you did see that we don't load everything into the memory before we start writing, right? So uh, we read and write in parallel. Uh, that's what happens behind the scene. Uh, and uh, it does work on node as well as multi-node level. We work on a producer consumer approach where uh, 
data gets partitioned across multiple connections basically and we use uh, pretty much use a full node uh, for uh, for this purpose yeah and partitioning how does it happen i mean it comes in from probably if you've got your uh, physical partitions enabled uh, set up on your database side of course we pick that uh, dynamic partitions are from different queries of course and it can be multiple files or multiple parts of a single file so that's how it gets picked and uh, yeah in terms of what are the configurable properties inside copy that you can tweak to achieve this performance right so we do have few uh, configurable values uh, the first one being ITO intelligent throughput optimization by default we set it to auto right but uh, that's the actual measure that represents the power the power in terms of the CPU the memory the network bandwidth I mean network resource allocation my bad uh, used within a single copy and the other one is the degree of parallelism uh, the parallel copy it's basically nothing but the number of threads that could be used uh, to you know move your data read from the sink and then land it back to the uh, to the I mean land it uh, write it to the sink and all of this happening in parallel so each of the thread actually does uh, read it from the source and write it back to the sink in parallel and the other setting being max concurrent connection uh, if in case you don't want to bombard your source you want to limit the number of concurrent connections that have been made to your source of course you can come back here and set that value as well uh, this is just to avoid the throttling at the source side so these are the configurable values that we do have within copy with that let me get on to the second topic that i had in mind which is metadata driven copy uh, using the metadata driven copy within the data pipeline of course uh, uh, you know you can achieve a large scale copy operation. Um, so uh, for this, uh, I, I was thinking I'll, I'll pick up a use case and demo this as well. Uh, keep in mind, we do have a known limitation at present where you wouldn't be able to parameterize fabric connections at present. Yeah, we, we would very soon get off that limitation, but yeah. Uh, for, for this demo, uh, what I've done is uh, I, I've, I've considered a use case where we are copying, uh, you know, data from multiple SQL tables. The use case is just copy data from multiple SQL tables and land it onto uh, the fabric lake as CSV files, right? Uh, for this approach, of course, uh, very simple. We're just using a control table, which would contain the names of the uh, objects that I would want to uh, iterate over basically and pick them up and copy them uh, and land it onto the destination. So the control table contains the list of objects, uh, which includes the database name, the schema name, the table name, as well as I'm just adding the, uh, the destination file name as well in here. And then what I'm doing is basically in my design, I have a, uh, uh, a lookup, which is going to look up this particular control table, uh, get the output of this table, and then I'm passing that onto a for each loop, uh, for each container, uh, inside the container is where I'm going to have a copy activity, which iterates over uh, each of these items and does the copy. So pretty much a simple, straightforward one just for now. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I will go to my next slide, which is again, a recorded demo. In this demo, let us look at a simple way to build large scale data copy pipelines with metadata driven approach using copy activity. Our use case is to copy data from multiple SQL tables and land this data into Fabric Lake House as CSV files. Let us start with the control table. The control table contains the information of the source table that needs to be copied. This includes the database name, the table schema, and the table name. Along with this, we are including the destination file names in addition. Let's head back to Fabric Data Factory. Let's start designing our data pipeline. Let's create a data pipeline. Give this a name. Let's create. Once the data pipeline is created, let's add a lookup activity. Let's give this a name, control table, and the settings, 
let's go ahead and connect this back to the control table i already have the connection to my control table Let's hit the use query and provide a select star from the control table. We can go ahead and preview the data. That looks fine to me. Now we've finished adding the lookup activity, which provides the content from the control table. Now let's go ahead and add a for each container. Connect the lookup activity to the for each container. Give a name to for each container. Let's call it for each table. Under the settings of for each container, let's go ahead and add the expression to iterate over the lookup table output values. Now let's hit the OK button. Now let's go ahead and add the copy data activity inside the for each container. Here, let's give it a name, copy table data. Then let's go to the source settings. Uh, I already have the connection to my source database. So let me go ahead and select that. Connection type is equal to DB and the source table. I'm going to use the dynamic content to pull the database name from the control table here. So that's going to be item dot source database name. Let's hit the OK button. Now let's use the use query option and the query is going to be again an expression. This is going to be select star from schema dot table name. So I am adding the respective expression inside, hitting the OK button here. Now let's proceed to the destination settings. Here we are planning to land the data into Fabric Lake House's files. So let me go ahead and select the Lake House. Click on files. Let's proceed to add the subfolder that we had created under the lake house where we would want these files to land. Then provide the file name. We would want these file names to be picked from the control table. So let's add the dynamic content for that. Click OK. Let's leave the other settings unchanged. Now we have built a parameterized data pipeline, which would look up the control table for the list of tables that needs to be moved. And within the for each loop, we will iterate over each of these tables and copy the content onto the destination. Let's go ahead and run this. The pipeline is now saved and it started running. The pipeline has now executed successfully. Now let's head back to the Fabric Lake house and verify that the files have landed here, create. Here we go. We've got all the tables and its content being pushed to the lake house. Using a simple metadata driven copy pipelines, we were able to move multiple SQL tables to Fabric Lake House successfully. Thank you. Great, okay. So with that, let me hand this over uh, to here and yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Dataflows Gen 2. How many of you have already tried using Dataflows Gen 2? All right.
right? Pretty good. And uh, probably also data flows in Power BI and Power Apps or even in Teams or something like that. Well, today we're going to look at a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, we're going to have a look at the performance optimizations you can apply in your data flow or keep in mind while developing your data flow uh, going forward uh, to get the most out of data flows gen 2. And then afterwards, we'll go through a couple of items that we have on uh, functions within data flows that are AI infused. So smart ways of getting data. Uh, I leave Copilot aside considering the time, but I think most of you have seen the Copilot stuff already. Um, yeah, with that, uh, we got four performance principles. Uh, the first one is try to delegate as much as you can to the most co capable resource. The second time is sometimes you need to do the most expensive work first. Uh, and then the third uh, one is divide and conquer. And the fourth one is be lazy. Uh, and I think for most of you that are quite familiar with Power BI already, uh, the be lazy stands to the lazy evaluation that we have uh, within Power Query. So if we map these principles into the capabilities that we have in Dataflows Gen 2, is that the delegation is the query folding that you have with the query folding indicator next to the steps of your Dataflow Gen 2. Um, and that means that most of the data that you're trying to get are already folded at the source. So you're not doing that expensive work um, uh, in the data flow itself. Uh, then the expensive uh, work first. So in some cases, you may want to use staging uh, to get your data into the data flow and then do the transformations. Uh, and this really depends if your que query is able to fold or not. So we'll get a deep dive into that uh, to get more sense of when is this is applicable or not. Uh, then divide and conquer. Uh, so there's a new feature coming up soon uh, that's called fast copy. That's some collaboration between data flows and the pipeline. So the copy activity you just have seen on the screen uh, is some way behind the scenes incorporated in data flows gen 2 as well. Uh, it's on the roadmap for us to, to release soon. Uh, partitioning, uh, something you can already do today, uh, but will be better uh, going forward. Um, incremental refresh, again, a feature that's coming soon, uh, and that allows you to only get the data you need. So again, being lazy, you're not going to get data that you're not using. Just do the bare minimum that's necessary to get the result you want from your data flow gen 2. And then the last one, lazy evaluation, a native thing of Power Query uh, of make sure the dependencies between your step uh, and that only the necessary steps are being performed during the refresh. Uh, so with that, uh, what, what is query folding? So essentially it's a, um, it's a term that um, is known by a couple of things. So it's uh, query delegation, query pushdown, or remote or distributed query evaluation, meaning that you're pushing it outside your uh, operation. So you basically tell the SQL engine uh, that you're consuming the data from to fold uh, to a group by instead of getting all the data and doing the group by yourself. So that's what the query folding essentially does. It tries to tell the source, I want the data in this format and not, um, uh, and not do the work yourself. Um, whenever possible, um, the M query script is translated into a native query. So if you're doing indeed a group by, a filter, uh, and anything like that within your Power Query or within uh, while you're in the authoring session of your data flow, it will be translated into a native query. So in this case, it could be a SQL query that's just select X, Y, Z from and then group by. So that's natively translated and the Power Query engine tries to be as smart as possible to, to achieve that. Um, and then the native query is then executed by the, by the source, of course. So looking at an example, I probably need to zoom in a bit. I already skipped the <coughs> template to ensure that it uh, uh, will fit on the slide. But uh, this is an M script generated by the UI. So in this case, I'm getting data from a lake house. I'm filtering. Uh, so the first step is the navigation within your lake house to navigate to the table you want. In this case, I'm looking for the employee table within my lake house and there I only want the full-time FTEs um, within my uh, table. So that's filter step for uh, one. And then we have a group by that we want to do a group by uh, by uh, start date and do a count row. So we are doing basically, okay, for each date, how many uh, full-time employees started um, working at my company. 
then what the data flow engine does or the power query engine does in the back end is to translate this easy generated script that you can work with in the UI or with the advanced editor and transform it into a native query. This native query is then executed on the source and directly uh, sends the data uh, to the data flow uh, to work with. So in this case, select row dot start date uh, as start date, count one as count from, uh, and then the select segment from the database and do the group by. Uh, it's automatically generated. So this the logic yeah. that we have. I I don't know. It's, I wasn't there when it, this was uh, developed. So, um, but yeah, if you want to look this up, you can see the native query as well within the Dataflow editor. You're probably familiar with that. And oh 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 yeah, there we go. Um, then what I talked about is the query folding indicators, and this probably the most useful tip that you probably can use today already, is have a look at the applied steps that you have on the right hand side. Um, if your source supports folding, it will show it as a green uh, database icon with a lightning bolt next to it uh, that says that it's able to fold all the way to the source. The more steps you add, uh, the bigger the chance is that it may not be able to fold and make sure that they are in the correct order. So if you're doing a filter, do that as f soon as possible. Uh, if you want to do a group by, do that as soon as possible. Uh, and do not do uh, things that do not fold to the source. So in some cases, uh, a source doesn't allow you to do a pivot of your data. And in that case, you may want to leverage uh, the data flow engine instead all the way on the end so that you only get the necessary data and do the transformations later. And if it doesn't uh, fold, so in this case, we added a ranked column to our data set. Uh, and in this case, it wasn't able to fold and it shows a red indicator as the last step. Again, if I put this step more up, uh, it would be more expensive to run this data flow. So keep an eye out, try to get these red steps as low as possible in your tree or avoid them altogether. Um, then staging, staging is an somehow a new concept within Dataflows Gen 2. Within Dataflows Gen 1, we had basically, uh, you load the data into your data flow. Today we have data destination. So you have still storage within the data flow, but it's not required to be used uh, while uh, you're refreshing your data. So uh, in the Dataflow Gen 1 experience, you get the data uh, from your sources, load it into the data flow, and use the data flow connector to connect to your data. It's the only way you were able to get your data, essentially, uh, within your Power BI reports, within Excel, wherever, right? Um, but with Dataflow Gen 2, you have now this data destination. So staging is, for us, more performance optimization now. Uh, so what is this? It's basically loading the data into a lake house, the staging lake house, within the workspace. Um, and then the data within this lake house can be referenced by a SQL endpoint. So what you see if you create a lake house today already within your Fabric workspace, you get a nice SQL endpoint that you can talk with uh, and is optimized for doing group buys, pivoting your data and that kind of stuff. So uh, in this case that you see down here is I only want to get the data once. So I have uh, query one, which is uh, in this case, the New York taxi data. I stage this data, I, it's all CSV files. CSV files do not fold, so you cannot filter on it. Uh, I load this data into uh, the staging lake house and then reference this query uh, in the second two, where I want to do the transactions per month and the transactions per week. But because this data is now within this staging lake house, I'm able to use the SQL engine to do folding into the staging lake house. And on the next slide, if I zoom out a bit. Um, yeah, so um, weird order, but uh, so uh, the tips that we have, uh, if your data source is file-based or anything like that, uh, or is not SQL-based, uh, we suggest use, uh, using staging unless you write the full uh, data uh, directly to your des data destination. Um, data uh, source that are SQL-based are uh, less likely to need a, a staging storage. 
Uh, and for a fa faster altering experience, it's mostly suggested to have two data flows. So one data flow that gets all the data uh, from your sources uh, into the staging uh, area, and then use a second data flow to actually do the transformations on top of it. Um, and then uh, why is it faster? So that's what I wanted to allude to in a previous slide. Um, so this, the staged data is stored in that, in that staging lake house. The query against the staging lake house are able to fold. And the SQL endpoint is magnitudes faster than uh, doing it all in memory within the data flow engine. So in the example that we have here down below, you see that we have uh, the 2020 yellow taxi trip data in CSV files. And we have also the 2017 data uh, as well here. Uh, the file size of 2020 is uh, 2.2 gigabytes. Uh, the one for 2017 is almost 10 gigabytes. Uh, if I do the group by uh, and group and query on this taxi data right away from the data flow uh, editor uh, without any staging enabled, it will probably time out on the 10 gigabyte one and on the two gigabyte one, it will take at least four minutes to evaluate uh, the grouping on the CSV file because it needs to get all the data in, then do the transformations all in memory, uh, which is more expensive to do. Now, if I put this data first in a staging area and then do that reference thingy that you saw on the previous slide, it will only take two seconds. Uh, because this data is already in a staged area, I only have to basically ask the SQL endpoint what is the group by per start or trip date or per area or something like that. So you really get the benefit there from the SQL engine that you introduce within the whole end-to-end -end scenario. Okay. Um, then the next one, uh, how to get a fa faster uh, transfer speed within uh, Dataflow Gen 2. And one of them is partitioning. So partitioning is a way of breaking a big query into smaller pieces and run them in parallel. Uh, and that's basically what fast copy does in the backend. So like uh, Krishna already said, you can limit the number of concurrent connections and also the number of partitions that you're partitioning on. Um, and within Dataflows, you can do it already today. And with fast copy, you will be able to do it automatically when fast copy is an option within Dataflows Gen 2. Um, and it's for the same reason faster. Uh, uh, as fast copy uh, because you have the parallelism inside. So how does it look like? This is a, a short schema of how you can see what's happening behind the scenes. So by default, a data flow will run sequentially because there is no known partitioning within a data flow. It's just one query it needs to execute and it needs to get the result somewhere in a data destination. Uh, so it will do everything at once. So it's, it doesn't even know about partitions. But once you introduce the partitions within the Dataflow Gen 2, you can do those things in parallel. You can have multiple queries that does, for example, each month or each year, you have a uh, query that's being run. Uh, and you can say, OK, uh, I want to combine these all into a merge query and then write it to my data destination. Uh, an example of this would like look like this. It's a bit more complex, and that's why we try to make the optimizations with fast copy that allows you to have this basically by default or automatically. Um, but in this case, we have uh, the 2017 taxi uh, data again. It's about 113 million rows, so it's a pretty decent data set. Uh, and we're going to divide it basically in 10 separate dynamic buckets. And what we basically do, we have a function that strips down this <coughs> massive query into buckets of, um, of 10. So we divide the total row count by 10, each time we get a separate section of rows um, that we load into our data. And then we union those buckets into a single query and write it to our data destination. Again, because we are defining it by 10, if we look to our performance results uh, earlier, it's about at least seven times faster than doing it all together in, in one sequence. Uh, then last one, lazy evaluation. I think it's a pretty known one already within the community. Uh, and it's only evaluate what's bare, uh, bare minimum that's necessary to uh, get your result. So what data flows and the Power Query engine does basically in the backend, it calculates the step dependencies. So it goes back to your final results and going to look at each step before, is it necessary to get this result or not? Uh, and 
on top of that, the uh, Power Query engine applies a query optimization that tries to, with smart algorithms, try to make your query as efficient as possible to get the result you need. Again, uh, if you have some weird things going in there, it may not get the optimization you want, but it tries to optimize as much as you can um, to get this result. Um, then next up, AI-infused experiences. I'm not sure how are we on time. We have four minutes or? 14, okay, good. Um, that's a quick one. Um, so AI-infused experiences, you may have seen this before in sessions we did before, um, but we just want to remind you a couple of smart things that we have within, um, uh, within the Power Query editor uh, that makes life easier or even uh, better if you want to get data from, um, from web, for example. So column by example, uh, the video is playing here in the background. Uh, we all know this thing that you can say, I want to have a column by example, and you just start typing what you want to see in that column. Uh, then a algorithm is trying to figure out which columns do you try to combine? Do you want to have a delimiter in there? And it will try to generate the power query to get that result for each row in your data set. Uh, very powerful if you just want to get something done and don't want to worry about custom Power Query code and go into documentation. Um, so very powerful, just type in what you want and it will try to get that. Uh, second one, uh, this is the one that I love probably most, uh, especially when you have a website like SQLbit and you want just to get a list of uh, sponsors that are available on the website, you just fill in the URL uh, and it will be able to get the data uh, from that website without even you having to copy the data or update it every time. It will just look up every time you refresh the data on that website and try to get that table that's on the website into your uh, data flow. And I want to do a live demo, so I'm trying to get there soon, Nish. Um, yeah, the same goes for text and CSV. Sometimes you have weird formatted uh, text uh, that is very human readable in terms of how it's divided up in multiple columns, but it doesn't really make sense from a data perspective. Um, so you load it into the Power Query editor and you are just going to write out how you want this table to look like. And then it will try to figure out which values fit where and what the logical algorithm is to get the right values from your text file, even if it's single column, to put it in a multi-column uh, data set that you can use for your data transformations. Uh, fuzzy merge, uh, sometimes your values do not really match up. Again, not best practice to have weird values match with each other on fuzziness to make them uh, match, but uh, yeah, sometimes you have names where uh, they have all the weird characters within uh, a last name or a first name uh, that are in your area not applicable. Uh, but you have a data set that has that but with replaced characters. So in that case, you may want to evaluate if Fuzzy Merge allows you to get the result anyways uh, and try to get two tables connected with each other. Um, it's an option within the Merge operation and you can select uh, Fuzzy Merge instead. Then uh, data profiling is also part of your, what do you, what kind of data do I have here? What kind of data is relevant to each other? What's the distribution like? Uh, many data uh, scientists will use the uh, semantics of this and the profile uh, of, um, of your data uh, with moving forward. Um, so it gives you an instant uh, insight of what your data looks like when you're working with it. Um, and then this is one that I really love. If you do a, uh, if you have big tables, very wide tables within your Power Query editor, um, and you want to join them within um, within your data flow experience, you can hit the merge button and go to the right top corner. There's a little a light bulb up there that will tell you, we think that this column and this column will match, and you should use that for joining those two tables together. So it will try to look at the values, look at the column names, and see if this matches, and if it matches, it will show you as a, as a suggestion so that you don't have to scroll down to the correct columns and select the correct columns to, to join them up. So also there, it's very precise because it tries to look at the values, 
Uh, but again, double check before you hit anything and make sure that it's actually the right column that needs to be joined on. Um, then this, this is the thank you slide, but I have one little demo still, and that was the uh, SQL bit sponsor website. So we got here uh, on the SQL bits website, we got a list with sponsors, right? So a lot of information about sponsors, uh, basically the name, the text about it. Um, and it's a pretty long list. Uh, luckily, we have a, a great amount of sponsors here. Um, but I want to get that in my data set. Uh, so what I do, uh, I go to my Dataflow Gen 2. So in this case, this, uh, you can see uh, this is the Power Query Editor. And over here, I can uh, click on Web Page. So what it happens if I click on Web Page, uh, I basically copy the URL here and put it here. Uh, I already connected with this uh, because I was test driving the Wi-Fi here. Uh, it's not good, uh, but uh, we got hardwire now. Um, so we hit next, uh, and it will try to connect to the data source. It will first look at the data uh, or at the website itself and see if it can detect any tables already. Um, in this case, I know it will not detect a table on the website but we can use the example uh, function that we just uh, seen with the column by example just start writing the table that we want and see what happens uh, and if it's automatically detecting um, the columns and the data it's taking a bit longer than expected any questions maybe in in the meantime that we can take yeah, yeah you Right now we don't, yeah. So copy is, okay, the question is, uh, with the copy, do we have an option to do shortcuts as well? What's the, okay. So with the copy, of course, uh, you are trying to go ahead and bring in the data and move it, of course. You are not landing the data specifically at a specific destination. In my example, I was just showing Fabric Lake House, but it could be any other place for that matter, right? Whatever is supported. So shortcut doesn't work that way, right? So that's the difference that we're talking about here. Yeah, and I think it also depends on your use case. Uh, within an organization, you don't want to have multiple copies of your data, right? Uh, also there, you have to keep in mind that you may want to have a golden workspace mm -hmm. maybe where you do all your data integration stuff making sure that there is a dedicated team ensuring that the data quality is right over there and then share it with shortcuts across workspaces and let other people use the data uh, that's in there so you they don't have to worry about making sure that they make a copy every day and on the other side they have uh, there's just one single place of truth within your organization uh, it's something to think about but again that's probably also how your organization is set up and think about data management. All right, uh, I'll take the next question after this. Uh, we have this thing working now. Um, so you see that there is only a, a document here, so I can click on this. It will do a short preview of uh, what's shown there, but what I want to use is add table using examples. Um, so what we have here on the, uh, on the SQL Bits website is that we basically have a a sponsor name and a sponsor description. Uh, and the first two in this list is AMD and Microsoft. And if we put in here a uh, sponsor name, Ooh. yeah, sponsor name, uh, put in AMD, and then sponsor description, And I remember this was AMD is a high performance, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then we got Microsoft. And Microsoft is introducing intelligent platform. It's currently learning values. It doesn't really know yet that it needs to jump to this one. But again, here we have uh, a AMD. Uh, with the same description, actually. Um, and what you see here is that it's already able to get all the descriptions of each sponsor 
uh, automatically. So it starts filling in all the information for the sponsors that were given. And let me zoom in a bit so that you can see it properly. Um, so by just giving a couple of values here, uh, it goes to the website and see if there's any pattern it can take and it will extract that data. And every time you refresh, if there's an update on the website, it will also take this data into your data set and allow you to work with it going forward. So very powerful if you're doing a lot of copy stuff uh, instead. All right. Um, yeah, then I think we can really go into questions now. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, is that um, uh, on what kind of a value are you basically designing your partitioning on, right? Um, so the difference here is that we're not talking about how we store the data in partitions, is how we process the data in partitions. So this is data in transit, and what we actually do with the partitions here is try to split them up in multiple flows of data, multiple connections of data uh, to our data source. So in this case, as we are going to combine them all in a single query anyways, uh, it doesn't really matter which value we, we take. Uh, like the, I've shown in the example before is that you have um, basically a dynamic split, take the first thousand and then the second thousand and then the next three uh, thousand uh, in separate queries. Uh, that's something you could do to uh, just get multiple connections going to your data source and process them, process them in uh, parallel. Uh, so that's one of the options you can uh, leverage the partitioning in. And this is not about how we store the data. Uh, this is just a way of how we split up the data transfer. Uh, and I believe for fast or f within data pipelines, we have a configurable property okay. that you can say for this column, uh, I want to use uh, as a partitioning column. That's true. Yeah. Sure. Uh, sorry. Oh, the, the Git uh, support for... Um... So that's upcoming. Uh, that's in our roadmap. You would see it very soon. And I'm saying very soon. It's very, very soon. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and for Dataflow Gen 2, it may take a bit longer. But uh, yeah, pipelines definitely is sooner than Dataflow Gen 2. So soonish. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, what do you mean exactly? Yeah. Yes, yes. So the question is, uh, if you have a shortcut within your lake house, uh, can you connect to that lake house and use uh, the shortcut? Uh, as far as I'm aware, yes, you can uh, use that as it's also available within the SQL endpoint uh, when you create that um, shortcut. So yes. Okay, so the question is, um, we are releasing a lot of new features within uh, Azure Data Factory or within Fabric Data Factory, and will these f features eventually also land into Azure Data Factory, right? Right, so I'll take that question. So as you would know, both uh, EDF, Azure Data Factory, and Fabric Data Factory has their own roadmap and picture. So right now our target is to bridge the gaps between what we have in Azure Data Factory, bring that onto Fabric Data Factory. That's where we are working. So we're working on the parity, so to say, yeah. And once we bridge that gap, of course, we would be working on you know adding things balancing both things together, meaning bringing the co the goodness of Fabric back to Azure Data Factory as well. Yeah. But our current direction is making sure we bridge that gap right now. To yeah. All right. Uh, I've just had a heads up that we are at time. Uh, we would like to thank you very much for joining the session today. Uh, we'll be mostly hanging around at the Microsoft booth uh, later today. Basically, I have whole day booth duty. so. Uh, you can find me there, uh, you find Krishna there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Yeah.